Welcome to Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hanby. I'm your host, Amber Sitton. What is done in darkness will eventually come to light. That is the purpose of this podcast, to shine light on the disappearance of Jessica Hanby. Listener discretion is advised. The subject matter may involve violence, sexual content, murder, and adult themes. This episode does contain foul language. It is not suitable for younger listeners. This is episode two of season three of a serialized podcast, and the episodes are designed to be listened to in order. Jessica Leanne Hamby has been missing since January 3rd, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, the 24-year-old mother of three was a beautiful brunette with big hazel eyes. She had a head full of long, thick hair, was 5 foot 2, and weighed about 125 pounds. In the four and a half years since Jessica was last reported to be seen, The stories regarding her disappearance and fate have been plentiful, and the facts scarce. In Season 3 of Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby, we are starting from the beginning, and by the beginning, we are beginning with Jessica's life six months prior to her disappearance. We are going to focus on the details and try to discern fact from fiction. In this season, as always... You'll hear from private investigator Michael Fleming. You will also hear from a special guest. Private investigator Jeff Means with Sound Mind Investigations has been working on Jessica's case from almost the beginning. He has devoted thousands of man hours and uncountable resources to this case. Jeff's hard work has given us a head start in the case. If there's one fact we've discovered in Jessica's case... It's that it's difficult to determine any facts. There are so many different accounts and stories that contradict each other on even the most basic things. You're going to start hearing about some of these discrepancies in this episode. In the last episode, Jessica had arrived at the campers off U.S. Highway 43, where Gilbert Shaw and the other bridge construction workers were staying. Gilbert has been someone that Michael and Jeff have wanted to speak with for a couple years now. In one of our interviews, Jeff said this regarding Gilbert. I really, really think Gilbert Shaw is the key here. (laughs) I've been saying this over and over and over again. He's the central character in this, and and he knows it. He's got to know it. Me and Michael have been looking for this cat for years. He knows it. We've been to baby mama's house. We've been to mama's house. We've been to brother's house. We've been to the corner store that he sits and shoots the shit at. You know, we've done all this. You know, he knows we're looking for him. And he knows that we know he knows something. Michael was able to locate him last week. Michael called me after he finished talking with Gilbert, and I recorded our conversation. There's a lot of information in this interview, and you are going to hear a portion of it in this episode. You will hear the rest in the future. Hey, Amber. Hey. You will not believe who I found and talked to. Who? Gilbert Shaw. No way. How did that happen? I was able to find out where he was, and he's very, very close to me. Drove out there and met with him, and Sat down and finally got to interview him. What did he say? To start with, he uh, he confirmed that law enforcement talked to him years ago. He told me that they gave him a lie detector test, and they even held him for 72 hours in the jail just asking him questions. And he told me that he was willing to answer my questions and tell me all about that night and that what he would tell me would be the same thing that he told the investigators years ago. He remembered several of the investigators that interviewed him all those years ago, uh, even knew one of them by name. 
and was able to describe the other two. So it seemed like his his memory was was in good shape. And so he started telling me about that night. So was he able to answer any of our questions? Yeah. So um, he started off telling me that there were four other individuals at his camper that evening. Uh, he lived in the camper alone. It was just him. There were another three or four campers on the same site that were occupied by other workers, um, but he didn't have anyone else living with him. But that night, Eric Edwards, Shane Reynolds, initially he couldn't exactly recall Eric's girlfriend's name, but he was able to confirm that that was Alicia Motes and her brother, Derek Motes. All four of them were there. He told me that he knew Eric because Eric had, for a short period of time, worked for the same company on the new bridge that they were building north of Hamilton, but that Eric had been laid off or fired not long before that the night that Jessica came through because he had trouble showing up to work on time or sometimes not at all was what he told me. But he, long story short, he knew Eric because Eric had worked with him and the rest of the workers on the new bridge. He also knew Shane. He knew that Shane was Eric's cousin. And he told me that Shane and Eric were almost always together. As far as Alicia goes, he had seen Alicia a few times before, like at at the gas station, or um, he described one time Eric took him down to Raymond's place to his office at Edwards Trust, and Eric was showing him all the arrowheads that they had found, and they are still to this day hanging in display cases in Raymond's office. Uh, So uh, apparently he had met Alicia on a trip like that with Eric down to Raymond's house. He didn't really talk that much about Alicia's brother, Derek. I I didn't get the impression that he really knew him. He knew who he was. He knew that that was Alicia's brother and that he was hanging out or staying with Eric. But yeah, uh, he started right off the bat telling me that the four of them were at his trailer They were drinking, just hanging out. He said that they had done a few shots. Then we we got right to the point where Jessica arrived. And what did he say about Jessica? He said right off the bat, he had never met her before. He didn't know her or anything like that. And, And apparently he didn't know that she was on the way down. He told me that he got up at one point, he had to go to the bathroom, so he he went in the bathroom, and the other four were out in the uh, living area kind of space in the camper, and while he was in the bathroom, he heard a vehicle pull up. He described that, like, the parking area between where the campers were and the highway, it was all gravel that had been laid down, so he could clearly hear when a vehicle pulled in. And so while he was in the bathroom, he heard this vehicle pull up and he heard a knock on the door. And as he came out of the bathroom, Eric had opened the door and Jessica was standing in his doorway. That's how he described it. He came out of the bathroom and there's this girl that he had never met before standing in his in the doorway of his camper. He also said at the same time as he was coming out of the bathroom, he heard the vehicle that had apparently dropped her off leaving. He heard the tires on the gravel as the vehicle was leaving. That was his introduction to Jessica. Uh, He came out of the bathroom. She's standing there. Eric had opened the door to let her in. And Alicia and Derek and Shane were still in the camper as well. So. I mean, how long did they stay? By his recollection, they stayed possibly an hour and a half. He didn't think it was quite two hours that they were there. He felt like they left around midnight 
uh, maybe even 1230 or closer to 1 a.m. when they left. And there was a little story that went along with that as well. He said that as they were hanging out and talking, it seemed to him that Alicia and Jessica might not have been getting along. Uh, He described Alicia giving Jessica attitude. I kind of chuckled because he said the, the look on Alicia's face, the look in her eyes was like a horror movie. And he thought they were going to fight. I asked him if he had any idea what they were potentially going to fight about. And he said he didn't know, but he, he, he got the vibe that Alicia was mad because Jessica was there to kind of move in on Eric and Alicia and Eric were together and so he felt like that was what was going on there that this new girl showed up and alicia felt like she was there to take her man but later on in the night before they left gilbert told me that eric got up and went and spit in his sink i didn't ask him you know why why he would do that i i got the impression that you know eric was dipping or chewing or something like that but Eric spitting in Gilbert's sink. Gilbert took that as disrespectful and nasty. He he actually said that's nasty. I I don't want that. And Gilbert had to be at work again the next morning. They had to be on the job site by 630 in the morning. So Gilbert just took the spitting in the sink as a sign that the party's over. He told him, you guys, y'all need to leave. I've got to go to work in the morning. You're disrespecting me spitting in my sink. Y'all need to go. And so he, he thinks that that happened, that they left right around midnight. Like I said, somewhere between midnight and 1 a.m. Wow. So what did they do while they were there? I mean, what, what did he say about Jessica? I mean, other than obviously Alicia seemed to have an issue with Jessica. So he told me that not long after they got there, that Eric ripped up a Mountain Dew can and put a rock of ice, methamphetamine, on the the can and heated it up and he drew it up into a syringe and Jessica was standing at the sink and Eric came up and injected the ice into her left arm. And he said that Jessica started rubbing the spot on her arm and he demonstrated that. And she made the comment that it burns. And then they just went back to socializing, sitting around and talking and and stuff. He said that when they got up to leave, that Jessica seemed to be fine. She was conscious. She was talking, she was walking, Uh, no one had to carry her out or anything like that. But he did recall this instance where Eric used this Mountain Dew can and actually injected what he believes and felt pretty certain was methamphetamine, was ice. He even said that the injection, that Eric shot the injection into Jessica's left arm while she was standing at the sink. And he said this happened shortly after Jessica got there? Right. This happened not long after she arrived. And so she arrived around a few minutes after 10, and he doesn't think they left until somewhere between 12 and 1. So she was there for probably an hour and a half at least after she received that shot. Did he happen to say what she was wearing? He actually... So many different stories. I did ask him what she was wearing, and he had a pretty good description. He said that she had a bracelet on and black and brown slide shoes that had an orange strap that went around the back of the ankle. He also said she had on uh, like a flowery shirt, so a, a shirt that had flowers on it. And he also made the comment that she was not dressed for the cold weather that they were having. Pretty descriptive. It is. And he said that when they left, that she seemed fine. 
He did. He said that um, after the spitting incident, he, he told them it was time for them to leave. She got up, everyone got up, and, and they all walked out. And I asked him, what vehicle did they get in? He did admit that it was very dark, but he was pretty sure that Shane had arrived in his burgundy Chevy pickup truck and that Eric was driving the white Tahoe. Uh, Eric typically drove this white Tahoe. He said that he had also seen Eric driving his, he, he said his stepmother's blue car, a uh, Nissan Maxima, earlier or sometime that day. And because it was dark, he wasn't sure if some of them got into the blue car or if it was the white Tahoe. But he described them leaving in these two vehicles. What else did he say? Did he talk about interacting with them? I mean, did he ever see Jessica or any of them again that night? So I, I did ask him if any part of the group, even just one person, ever came back to the trailer or ever came back to the camper later that night or anything like that? Did he ever see Jessica again or any of the other ones? And he said no. He said that when they left, that was the last time he saw any of them. The audio you just heard can be taken as nothing more than what Gilbert told Michael about the events on the night of January 2nd. Much of what he said is contradictory to statements from others there that night, and also to the actual evidence. The hard evidence is all that can be taken as fact, but sometimes the contradictions and the untruths told can be very revealing as well. Let's take a closer look at Gilbert's account. Gilbert said that he heard a vehicle pull up, then leave as he exited the bathroom. Jessica had just been let into his camper by Eric Edwards. Gilbert stated he never saw who dropped Jessica off and that they did not come inside the camper. Private investigator Jeff Means told us this does not match the account given by Brooke and Jonathan. He said that Brooke told him she went inside the camper and got high that night. She also told Jeff that one of the men had a gun she didn't know which man it was, but she did indicate it was not Gilbert. Jeff said Brooke was able to describe the men and Alicia. According to Jeff, Eric Edwards also stated Brooke came inside the camper and that the females got high together in the camper bathroom. While we don't know what the true story is, we do know that their stories are inconsistent. The next thing Gilbert described was Jessica's clothing. He said she had on a bracelet, a flowery shirt, and black and brown slides with an orange strap around the back of her ankle. Brooke told Jeff that she let Jessica borrow clothes because she didn't have anything but summer clothes. She stated Jessica was wearing a dark pair of leggings, a pair of knee-high wool-type boots that had buttons on the side, and a cardigan sweater. Jeff also told us that Gilbert's account of Jessica's clothing doesn't match what one of the former State Bureau of Investigation investigators told him that Gilbert described. Jeff said that he was told Gilbert described a different type of shoe. Most people familiar with this case have always heard Jessica had nothing but summer clothes. Jessica's mom, Lynn, told us this. I don't know where they're getting that because I took her two bags of clothes up there that she had at my house, which was pants. Jessie was a t-shirt, blue jean type of girl. She liked her chucks, uh, her vans, Converse, you know, such like that. Um, I mean, I took her long sleeve shirts. I took her pants. I don't know why she didn't have any clothes. That's what I don't get. And where are the clothes and things that uh, the police got from down there? Her two duffel bags that were still there with all of her clothes and her personal hygiene and stuff in it. She had clothes. I don't understand why they're saying she didn't have clothes. Jessica has been missing four and a half years. Does it really matter what she was wearing that night? It does, because one of the main claims that people with her that night have made is that Jessica left walking 
in below freezing weather. We also think it's significant that there are so many greatly differing descriptions by these same people on what she was actually wearing. In Michael's interview with Gilbert, he also described Alicia having an attitude with Jessica as soon as Jessica arrived. He thought it was because Alicia believed Jessica had come there to steal her boyfriend. Obviously, we don't know what happened when Jessica arrived, but the interaction that he described between Jessica and Alicia is a sharp contrast to the friendly messages between the two in which it was apparent that Alicia wanted Jessica to come there. We did speak with another unnamed law enforcement officer who also interviewed Brooke and Jonathan. He told us that Brooke and Jonathan described Jessica as being agitated and having an attitude during the ride to the campers. They told him they didn't know why, other than she appeared to be angry with someone that she was constantly messaging with during the ride. Per the information obtained by law enforcement through the search warrants for various Facebook accounts, the only person Jessica communicated with during the ride to the campers was Alicia. If there was any conflict between them in those communications, they would have had to have been deleted from Jessica's account prior to law enforcement serving the search warrants to obtain the account information from Facebook. If Jessica was communicating with anyone other than Alicia during the drive, all of those communications would have had to have been deleted from Jessica's account prior to the search warrants. Another detail of interest is that Alicia deleted all of her communication with Jessica via Facebook Messenger from her own account before law enforcement sent the search warrants to Facebook. And she's not the only one who deleted messages. We'll discuss more about this in future episodes. You will hear more of what Gilbert had to say in future episodes, too, and about some additional, quite significant discrepancies. Now we are going to get back to the timeline for the rest of the night of January 2nd and the morning of January 3rd. From the time Jessica arrived at Gilbert's camper at 10.05 p.m., she only messaged Alicia Motes or Eric Edwards again one more time. We will get to that later, as it was one of, but not the last message she sent. According to her phone and Facebook records, Jessica didn't message anyone again until 11.03 p.m. when she and Brooke Graham began their marathon of text messages. As Jeff mentioned in the last episode, Jessica and Brooke, the female that Jessica left the detox facility with, exchanged 178 texts between 11.03 p.m. on January 2nd and 6 a.m. on January 3rd. Brooke was the one and only person that Jessica communicated with through traditional text, but she sent numerous messages to people via Facebook Messenger. In about 10 and a half hours from the time she turned her phone on until she sent her last message, Jessica sent 234 messages to 22 people over Facebook Messenger. That averages out to one sent message every two minutes and 43 seconds and does not count the messages other people sent her that she read. Not only are we looking at who she sent messages to and the content of those messages, but we are also looking for breaks or quiet time where Jessica wasn't communicating. I'll note these times as we walk through the night and morning hours. The first break in messages we see from Jessica is between 11.34 p.m. on January 2nd to 12.01 a.m. on January 3rd. Based on Gilbert's statement to Michael, this break occurred while she was at Gilbert's camper. Jessica's SMS text conversations also went quiet during this time. If you recall, before she left the detox facility, Jessica replied to a message from Travis Jackson, the man she referred to as her plug. She also tried to call him, but he didn't answer. Almost four hours later, at 12.50 a.m. on January 3rd, Travis replied to Jessica's message. He asked her where she was. 
even though Jessica was quite active communicating with others via messenger and also still texting with Brooke, it doesn't appear that she felt any urgency to reply to Travis. She finally got around to replying to him 41 minutes later at 1.31 a.m., which was the same time she started texting Brooke again. She told him she was in Hackleburg and asked him where he was. During that 41 minutes, however, she was sending messages to others almost every minute to Brooke via SMS, but she also became very active on Facebook Messenger. Those messages reveal something else that appeared to be occupying Jessica's mind, which we will come back to in future episodes, as it sets the stage for a recurring theme found in several of her conversations. We are going to talk about a lot of messages that Jessica sent, but the messages with Travis Jackson are particularly important, and you'll want to pay attention to them. Travis wasn't very quick to reply back to Jessica either. After telling him she was in Hackleburg and asking where he was, it took over an hour for him to message her again. Jessica continued to message others during that time frame. At 1.32 a.m., Jessica started a conversation with a man named Nate Dunstan. He asked her what she'd been up to, and Jessica responded with, Shit, sober life. In all, Jessica sent 28 messages to Nate. We will talk more about those messages in a bit. From 1.34 a.m. till 2.49 a.m., Jessica went quiet. While she was receiving a lot of messages... She didn't respond to anyone during this time frame. This is one of those important lulls in her conversation activities. This lull wasn't just on Facebook Messenger either. From 1.35 a.m. until 3.16 a.m., Jessica received 27 SMS text messages from Brooke, but did not respond. At 2.49 a.m., Jessica had a new topic on her mind. She wanted to get a tattoo, one to cover up an existing tattoo that she was unhappy with. She added a local guy to her Messenger account, and at 2.51 a.m., she sent him a message that read, Eric said to message you. He said you do damn good tattoos. He said call him, and she gave the guy Eric's phone number. From 2.49 a.m. to 6.15 a.m., Jessica had a steady stream of conversations with numerous people. At 3.11 a.m., Travis Jackson replied back to Jessica's earlier question about his location. He told her he was in Red Bay. He said he'd been put on the couch by his girlfriend and he needed a ride out of there. Jessica replied to him and said, let me make some calls. Can you get any boy? Boy is a commonly used name for heroin, and it was Jessica's drug of choice. She quickly sent another message to him, telling him if he could get the heroin, she could borrow a car. Ten minutes later, at 3.23 a.m., Travis replied back to Jessica. He told her he could get Boy and that he knew where morphine tabs were waiting. Twelve minutes later, Jessica told Travis to let her get a car. At 3.41 a.m., Jessica began to contact people to ask them for a ride. There are many messages with Jessica trying to convince someone to give her a ride. We will discuss these messages a little later in this episode. She then sent another message to Travis, reassuring him, I've got you, boo. At 3.47 a.m., Jessica sent Travis a message that gives a little bit of insight into her plans. She asked him, Can you help with gas for the way back and maybe throw a girl some boy? She fully intended to pick Travis up and bring him back with her. This matches up to what she was requesting of people in the conversations she had looking for a ride. The first person Jessica contacted after deciding to pick Travis up in Red Bay was someone she was already connected with on Facebook and who seemed to know her, a man in nearby Vina, Alabama, 
that goes by the username Rosie. Robert Lance Roselle. Roselle's Facebook shows that he is friends with Jessica and many of the names that come up in Jessica's disappearance, including Eric Edwards and Alicia Motes. Jessica sent 29 messages to Roselle between 3.41 a.m. and 5.18 a.m. The conversation started out with Roselle messaging Jessica, Hey there, and she immediately replied, asking if he had a car. Roselle said no, but I do have a pickup. She asked if he can take her to pick someone up, and he asked when. Jessica told him at daybreak. This would become a recurring theme in messages looking for a ride. She didn't want to leave until the sun came up. Jessica tells him that Travis will hook him up, and Roselle asked where he is. He points out that Travis must not be much of a hookup if he can't afford a car. Roselle asks several more times where Travis needs to be picked up from, and it seems evident he is losing interest and getting annoyed by 3.50 a.m. when he tells her he would rather deer hunt. Two minutes later, he tells Jessica, Fuck it then. Bastard can hoof it. She finally tells him that he would have to come get her in Hackleburg and then go to Red Bay. He tells her that he's five minutes away from Red Bay and there's a reason he doesn't go there, to which Jessica asks if he can pick Travis up and bring him to where I am so he can give me what I need, please. I'm so sick. Roselle hints at his reasoning for not wanting to go to Red Bay, which involves another individual with a history of drug arrest. Ultimately, he says no and tells Jessica, you should get a goddamn job and buy you a ride. At that point, Jessica's feisty personality comes out. She tells him, I see what kind of person you are, and lectures him on having an ugly soul and that she doesn't need negative people like him in her life. Roselle fires back at her with a deeply personal attack. I raise my boy and put clothes on his back like a respectable human. You don't see me up and leaving him for dope or any other bullshit. Say what you want to, but before you judge my simple ass, do your own inventory first. The conversation deteriorates further from there, with the two sending vulgarities before Jessica sends, I'm sorry for what I said, for real. I apologize sincerely, I do. My higher power would punish me tenfold. So, Rosie, I'm sorry, and I love you, fam. Followed by four different colored hearts. That's the last message between them until February 16th, when Roselle sends Jessica a message saying, You in the Times Daily newspaper this morning as a missing person. This was how many of Jessica's conversations went that night, with her asking for a ride to go to Red Bay and pick Travis up, and those conversations ultimately ending with a no. The common threads in these messages are that Travis would pay for gas, give them drugs, and she wanted to bring him back to the area north of Hamilton with her. She wanted this to happen around dawn, between 6.30 and 7 a.m. At 4.02 a.m., Jessica placed a call to Travis via messenger that lasted for 37 seconds. She called him again at 4.05 a.m., and that call was for 43 seconds. Of course, we have no way of knowing the content of their conversation in these two calls. At 4.07 a.m., Jessica sent her last SMS message to Brooke as well. Brooke sent her four more messages at 4.09 a.m. and two more at 6.03 a.m., but Jessica did not reply to any of them. After exchanging 178 texts in a seven-hour time span, Brooke never texted Jessica again, not later that day or in the days that followed. At 4.11 a.m., Travis replied to Jessica's earlier question about providing gas and drugs to whoever agreed to pick him up. He told her that, yes, he could give help with gas, and if not boy, he could give some strips or other. 
He also said he could give them just cash, but it would be a win-win situation for whoever came. The strips he referred to are typically Suboxone strips, which are a prescription treatment for opioid addiction. Unfortunately, it seems that Suboxone is regularly bought, sold, traded, and abused, just like many other prescription medications. At 4.13 a.m., Travis sent Jessica a message that read, Going on a big run. Half P, but don't tell no one. She replied almost immediately. She said, I got you. At 4.15 a.m., Travis told Jessica that she's about to win a spot on the starting team. At 4.19 a.m., Travis adds, Pull this off and watch if you get a promotion. Jessica responded immediately and asked him if he still had that house available in Florence. At 4.23 a.m., Travis told Jessica, Yeah, if you do this, I'll duck you off with me till you get on your feet. Me and old girl probably not going to make it. This promise of setting her up in a place to get her life together was something that Jessica shared with one of the people she contacted to ask for a ride after they chastised her for offering them drugs in exchange for their help. Jessica tried to enlist help by approaching each individual in a way that would resonate with them and convince them. Many of the people she asked were drug users, and offering them drugs or cash would usually work. Others, those that were in recovery or not users, she tailored her approach to strum their personal heartstrings. Telling them Travis was going to help her get on her feet was one of those tactics, and it's common in rehabilitation and treatment programs for addicts to develop a to-do list of steps they needed to take to re-enter society as a recovering addict. Jessica's mother shared such a list with us, handwritten by Jessica in one of the treatment programs she went through over the years. Jessica and Travis continued to exchange messages while she tried to secure a ride to get him. She told Travis, I need clean point, indicating that in addition to the heroin she asked him for, she needed a clean needle. Jessica had been studying to become a certified nursing assistant, and in 2017, Jessica learned that her health was deteriorating as a result of continued drug use. The diagnosis she received could be treated, but to prevent complications or new infection, she knew she had to avoid sharing needles at a minimum. Having struck out on finding someone to pick up Travis in Red Bay, at 4.20 a.m., Jessica turned her attention back to Nate Dunstan, telling him, I either need a ride or a car. Just over an hour later, at 5.26 a.m., Nate responded, telling her he had a car for sale. Jessica replied within minutes, asking how much, and explaining that it was one of the three things I must have to get my babies back home. This wasn't entirely true. Jessica had surrendered custody of her children to her father at this point to ensure that they were with family and that she could see them without the interference or oversight of DHR. Nate told Jessica the car was $2,000, and Jessica asked if he would take payments, adding that she was in dire need because she had been kicked out of her mother's house. Nate didn't respond to her question, and Jessica continued her search, contacting several more people with the same request and promises of gas and drugs. In the midst of those other requests, at 5.45 a.m., Nate said he would do it. Yeah, I'm with my buddy, and we will do it. He then asked where she was. Jessica sent him a map location pin to the home of Raymond and Louise Edwards on Elgin Cochran Road, the same place that Eric Edwards lived. Jessica was excited. She told Nate to come in 45 minutes to an hour and that she needed to take a shower and let it get daylight. Even though Nate had agreed, Jessica continued a conversation with a woman whose name we were already familiar with from our work in Walker County. Suffice it to say, this woman has a reputation for trouble and has been a person of interest in at least one death investigation. 
over the years, multiple law enforcement officers have responded to questions about her with, she's bad news. We won't mention her name here, but she also agreed to help Jessica at 5.54 a.m. and asked where to go. Jessica never replied to her. Instead, at 5.56 a.m., she sent a new message to Travis. I'm excited to see your face, LOL. Followed by, be there soon, boo. Don't let her talk you into staying after I've done work my magic. Travis responded a minute later just to say okay. At 5.59 a.m., Travis sent another message. You in Ben's? According to Jeff's information and confirmation we've obtained, this question is in regards to a Mercedes that Jessica had borrowed before Christmas in 2017 and had been in when she visited Travis. Jessica did not reply to him immediately. Instead, from 6.03 a.m. to 6.15 a.m., she was talking to Nate exclusively, telling him she would be ready and they were going to get tattoos after picking Travis up, and they would have morphine to sell too. She then started asking him where he was and how long it would be before he headed that way. Nate didn't respond to her immediately. At 6.56 a.m., Jessica messaged Nate again and asked where he was. It would be almost 30 minutes before Nate answered Jessica at 7.24 a.m., and she didn't reply to Travis's question about the bins until 7.45 a.m. During that time, Jessica received a message from someone she knew well. His name is Marcos Pagan, and he was someone that Jessica had previously been in a romantic relationship with. Jessica had been wanting to talk to Marcos, and she had a conversation with his mother earlier that morning. Marcos didn't appreciate some of the things Jessica had relayed to his mother about him. The topic of the rest of their conversation is something we will cover in a later episode, because it involves something that happened a year prior, and in many ways drove Jessica to the decisions leading her to Alicia and the North Fork area the night of January 2nd. But for now, there's one point we want to make clear. We believe the content of Jessica's conversation with Marcos is a clear indication that she was the one sending the messages to him and that she was alive and well at this time. She sent that final message to Marcos at 7.37 a.m. The conversation between them was of a personal nature, and it isn't one where it's likely that someone else was pretending to be Jessica due to the content of their conversation not being common knowledge. At 7.24 a.m., Nate Dunstan answered Jessica, telling her he was still in Muscle Shoals but that he planned on coming to get her. He asked her what they would have to do. Jessica replied at 7.31 a.m., Come get me, go get him, let's get his motel room and go tattoo. Five minutes later, Nate asked her, Who is him? At 7.42 a.m., Jessica said, My plug, he hooking us all the way up, plus gas and cash and goodies. Nate asked if he knew him, and Jessica told him, Nah, he a high up. At that point, 7.45 a.m. on January 3rd, Jessica finally answered Travis's question about her being in the Mercedes. She told him, Nah, diff. Found a car, $2,000, though. That would be her last message to Travis. She never told him Nate had agreed to pick her up and he never asked where she was or how long she would be. The next message to Jessica from Travis's account would come well after Jessica had fallen off the radar at 5.22 p.m. on the evening of January 3rd. I wanted to go back with you today. In his investigation, Jeff Means talked to Travis's girlfriend at the time. She told Jeff that she sent that message from Travis's phone to see what Jessica would say back because she suspected that Travis had lied to her about where he had been the previous night, and she suspected that Travis had been with Jessica. 
one minute after Travis's last message, Nate asked Jessica, which goodies? Jessica told him, Zan's Morph's Glass Bud at 7.48 a.m. At 7.51 a.m., Jessica broke her silence with Eric's Facebook account. You'll remember that she had been communicating with Alicia over Eric's account on her way from Lakeland to Gilbert's camper, but had stopped messaging that account after she arrived. The message read, Hey, they ain't gonna shoot me for walking. Two minutes later, at 7.53 a.m., Jessica tried calling Eric's phone directly, but he did not answer and it went to voicemail. At 7.54 a.m., one minute after she tried to call Eric's phone, Nate sent a message asking, Gotta bang the morphs? Followed by, I'm cool, just wondering. Jessica replied immediately, saying, You can, but don't have to. Nate sent two more messages to Jessica at 7.58 a.m. and 7.59 a.m. Jessica never replied. While calls, texts, and Facebook messages continued to be sent to Jessica after 8 a.m. on January 3rd, she did not interact with anyone on her phone or Facebook account after 7.54 a.m., and even her cell data usage stopped. Jessica's phone has never been recovered. Many of the statements that have been made to investigators about what went on that night seem to fit well with the dialogue contained in Jessica's messages. The story usually goes that after arriving at Eric's house and hanging out for a while, everyone went to sleep at Eric's place and Jessica left on foot early that morning and when they woke up, she was gone. At other points, people questioned about that night have commented that Jessica left on foot because she wanted to watch the sunrise. Louise Edwards, Eric's adoptive mother, told Jeff Means that Eric told investigators that Jessica left to go out and watch the sunrise. She said Eric told Jessica not to go in a certain direction because there were bluffs. One of Eric's cousins said that Derek Motes, Alicia's brother, told her that Jessica was going to look at the sunrise. In a message to Jessica's mother, Alicia Motes stated, I fucking gave her ass somewhere to stay because she said she had no fucking where to go. That's it. She wanted a ride to go to her dudes in Red Bay, and I ain't got a car. She left while we were asleep. We pointed out that Jessica's messages make it clear that she wanted the timing of her leaving to pick up Travis in Red Bay to coincide with daybreak or daylight. Nautical twilight is the half-hour period where the sky goes from complete darkness to some lightening of the sky, enough light to silhouette trees and buildings against the sky, but still very dim on the ground. Street lights equipped with dusk-to-dawn sensors usually remain on during nautical twilight. Civil twilight is a half-hour period where the sky lightens all over, but the sun has not yet risen above the horizon. During civil twilight, automatic street lights start to turn off, and you can begin to distinguish the colors of objects on the ground. Civil twilight is what most people are referring to when they say daybreak or daylight. The end of civil twilight usually coincides with sunrise, the point where the sun rises above the horizon. On January 3, 2018, in Hamilton, Alabama, nautical twilight, or first light, started at 5.59 a.m. Civil twilight started at 6.30 a.m., and the sun rose above the horizon at 6.56 a.m. At 5.53 and 6.53 a.m. on January 3rd, the temperatures in Hamilton were recorded at 21 degrees. By 7.53 a.m., it had only risen to 22 degrees. Jessica told Nate, I got a shower, let it get daylight, at 5.50 a.m., 
and there have been statements made by people in the Edwards home that morning that she was in the bathroom getting ready to take a shower around 6 a.m. If Jessica had an interest in walking somewhere to see the sunrise, she would have missed it by the time she finished her shower, especially if she washed her hair and needed to dry it before going out into the freezing weather. While it seems there must have been some significance to daybreak or sunrise that day, we do not think it had anything to do with Jessica walking to watch the sunrise. The people that were present at Eric's house that night have explained her last message to Eric's account. Hey, they ain't gonna shoot me for walking. As a reference to a warning frequently given to guests at the Edwards property, that they had problems with people stealing, and that if Raymond Edwards saw someone on the property in the night, there was a chance they'd get shot. There are problems with that, however. One issue is that Jessica clearly wasn't sleeping. But there's an even bigger problem with the idea that she was at Eric's all night and then walked off on the morning of January 3rd. In Episode 3, we will talk about Jessica's phone records in depth and reveal what they tell us about her activities that night. You won't want to miss out on that. Join us next time as we continue to investigate the disappearance of Jessica Hamby and push for justice for Jessica. If you have any information that could help to solve the disappearance of Jessica Hamby, please email me at secretstruecrime at gmail.com or call our confidential tip line at 205-282-0740. Michael and I will ensure that all information gets to the right place right away. If you are left still wanting even more content, please check us out on Patreon. We have filled it with great information about Susan and Evan, Eric and Gypsy, and we will be continuing to add content about Jessica. This podcast is an independent podcast. That means that everything that goes into making this podcast is done and funded by me. All of the investigative tools and resources are provided by Echo 7 Foxtrot, and in this case, also Jeff Means with Sound Mind Investigations. The tragedies we highlight and investigate have had a tremendous impact on the victims, loved ones, and friends. We don't burden them with additional expenses to cover their cases. We donate our time and talents because we want to help and hope to find the answers they need that are long overdue. For as little as $5 per month, you can receive exclusive access to members-only photos, videos, early access to episodes, and much, much more. By becoming a patron, you are helping us help these families. Patreon.com slash secrets crime. I will also post the link on our Facebook page. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to follow or subscribe in your podcast player of choice and by giving us a five-star rating. We are active on social media and will often share photos of Jessica. Follow Secrets True Crime on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secrets Crime. This episode was co-written by me and Michael Fleming. The audio production for this podcast is by Kane Power at precisionpodcasting.com. From the late 1960s to the early 1990s, the United States saw an unprecedented surge in serial killing, rooted not just in the dynamic changes of the post-war period, but then the development of the human psyche going back many millennia to our ancient past. Wonder why serial killers exist, why they emerge, and why they exploded in the post-war United States? Check out The Golden Age of Murder, a panoramic look at serial killing focusing on the United States in the post-war period with your hosts, Toby and Simeon.